Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hi, and welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the podcast from the American Bar Association Antitrust Law Section. My name is John Roberti. Today's topic is, what's the state of things? Three things I would keep, three things I would change. What we want to do today is we want to have, um, we have a series of discussions with with folks who are thought leaders in the competition and consumer protection bars. And what we want to ask them is to take stock, think about three things that you like, three things you would keep about the area of law in which you practice or the area, the area of economics in, in some cases, and three things that you would change. Simple topic. We're going to, we're going to do it with a, with a few people and uh, we're going to kick that off today. My co-host today is Tammy Zhu. Hi, Tammy. Hi, John. So, Tammy, what do we have lined up today? We are talking with Diana Moss today. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know Diana Moss or know Diana Moss and want to uh, know more about her, she is an economist and she's been analyzing competition for decades. Uh, Diana Moss has sat on all sides of the table. She uh, worked in private practice defending mergers um, early on in her career. She moved on to, um, she uh, became a federal merger regulator. Uh, now she teaches at the University of Colorado. And for the past four years, she has also been president of the American Antitrust Institute, the AAI. So Diana Moss is an active and important voice um, who has been speaking up against some of our most recent large mergers, including the CVS Aetna merger, um, T-Mobile and Sprint. She's been advocating for scrutiny of big tech and its acquisition of national competitors. Well, great. Well, why don't we bring in our guest, Diana? Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. So, Diana, before we before we dive into it, let could you tell us a little bit about what is the American Antitrust Institute? What's your mission? Sure. Well, the AAI <clears throat> has been around for just over 20 years now. We were founded back in uh, 1998. Uh, we are the leading uh, research, education, and advocacy organization devoting, devoted to promoting uh, more vigorous competition um, for, in the interests of the competitive process of consumers, workers, innovation, our market-based system. And uh, we accomplish our goals and our mission through a number of programs. We have an amicus program. We have a policy and economic analysis program. Uh, we're very active at the agencies and sector regulators and the courts. And um, I think have served a very, very important purpose in, uh, in promoting the importance of antitrust and stronger enforcement during a very, um, an increasingly difficult time. Well, great. So why don't we dive into our topic today, which is three things I would keep, three things I would change. And let's start with the keeps, the things that you like. Diana, what's number one on your list? What is one thing that you like or would keep about antitrust law? I think I think a really important um, thing to keep is the focus or the spotlight on the importance of antitrust. Uh, you know, it's a small esoteric part of the law uh, in the bigger scheme of things, but it's really vital. It's vital to supporting our market-based system for um, for making sure that conduct and consolidation in markets is within the parameters. Uh, of the antitrust laws. And I think we see that in a number of, um, of current cases. Well, can you give us some examples of, uh, of some of the cases that you think have been important where antitrust has shown its value? Sure. So take the Sprint T-Mobile case, which is sort of ongoing right now. That was uh, what we call a four to three merger, uh, where there is quite a bit of evidence that shows that uh, four to threes are uh, very likely to produce 
um, adverse effects, higher prices, lower quality, less innovation. And, you know, the fact that the states have stepped forward with, uh, with the case to um, uh, block that merger, I think really speaks volumes about the importance of protecting consumers. You know, all the no poach cases we see on the, on, the, on the labor side, I think are vitally important for protecting workers, uh, you know, in all segments. And, um, you know, the list goes on. I, I think antitrust is really, really, really important for, um, for promoting competition, for protecting consumers' work and workers, and supporting our market-based system. Interesting. Diana, I have a follow-up question for you on that. Um, when you talk about Sprint and T-Mobile, I think one of their big arguments is that, look, if they don't combine, then they're not going to be able to survive independently um, among the other big carriers like at and and Verizon, especially with the move towards 5G. Um, why, why don't you buy that argument? Right. So that's a pretty common argument for justifying a merger, um, either the efficiencies claims, cost savings and, and how mergers will produce consumer benefits. Or, as you say, Tammy, uh, how a firm cannot survive unless they, they merge to get bigger. That's, that's typically not a very compelling reason for antitrust enforcers to justify uh, mergers, especially in really concentrated markets. And in Sprint T-Mobile's case, we know that each company um, did go out pre-merger, before the merger was announced, and and start engaging and rolling out 5G. So we know they could do it as separate standalone companies. Uh, they had the wherewithal and access to the resources to do that. So hard to justify a merger on the basis of rolling out 5G. And, um, you know, on the, on the efficiency side, you know, when you have a really highly concentrated merger that that uh, is likely to harm consumers and competition, um, you know, you've got a really heavy lift on making uh, justifications for that in terms of, of cost savings and, um, um, you know, other consumer benefits claims like the 5G claims. So very skeptical in this case, obviously not in all mergers, but in a 43 uh, where the evidence is stacked against it in terms of um, in terms of being harmful, um, I think um, I think the states have made a really good move on that front. Thank you, Diana. Let's go to let's go to like number two. What's what's the second thing that you like about antitrust law? Yeah, I, I think what I what I like about a second thing I like about antitrust law, particularly in this era that we're living in, where there's a big debate around antitrust and the role of antitrust and possible reforms, um, is that good antitrust enforcers, good uh, antitrust practitioners really uh, continue to see the bigger picture. So, you know, oftentimes the media gets diverted uh, onto particular topics and and into particular sectors. Big tech would be the one uh, that we see the most, um, uh, that gets the most airplay. But um, I, I, I think it's really um, gratifying that the NHS community continues to see the importance of enforcement across all three areas of the law, right? Mergers, uh, monopolies, and agreements, but also across all sectors. You know, some sectors aren't as, as, um, aren't as um, attractive as other sectors, but we see problems in healthcare and, and food and ag and uh, energy. Uh, it's not just all about big tech. So I like the fact that the community keeps their eye on the ball and sees the big picture. Diana, why do you think that is? What What is it about the community that, that gives them the, those, those kinds of sensibilities? Well, you know, certainly from an enforcer standpoint, um, you know, they are required to um, to enforce the laws in all three areas. Um, but, you know, the agencies themselves have these remarkable staffs of professionals, economists and lawyers and institutional experts. And the states have some really good antitrust shops, some of the bigger states. And, um, uh, you know, these are people who have who have deep experience and uh, really understand the importance of, you know, the, the collective of what antitrust law covers. And um, I, I, I think that dedication and that interest and that training and and specialized training in antitrust law and economics and institutions really drives that, um, uh, really drives uh, efforts to make sure that enforcement is comprehensive and across all sectors and all areas of the law, as opposed to sort of really drilling down into uh, any particular sector 
um, and giving it un, sort of undue weight in the bigger scheme of things. All right. Well, let's go to like number three. What is the third thing you like about antitrust law? So I think the, the third thing is, um, is perhaps specific to my gender, but, but maybe not. Uh, we're seeing more and more women gravitating to antitrust um, as lawyers, as economists, and I, I think this is really terrific. Uh, if you look at the staffs of the agencies, if you look at uh, the states, uh, the attorney generals, if you look at private enforcers, we are seeing lots and lots of women come in uh, who are, you know, uh, extremely bright, who are proving to be really competent and successful and impactful litigators. And uh, I think the landscape is changing in, in antitrust, which used to be, you know, pretty much a male dominated field. So, so I think this is terrific. And uh, these women have amazing role models, both on the defense side and the plaintiff side uh, in, in sort of making their mark on, on the uh, profession. Yeah, Diana, this is, um, this is a change that I've, I've, in the last few years of my relatively junior career, and it's also something that makes me, um, I'm very happy about it um, and the trajectory that it's going in. Um, so what, um, what got you really invested in this space in um, economics and in particular in antitrust economics? In the time when you started, I bet the landscape was, was different and probably more daunting. Um, what got you to um, do it? go for it. Yeah, it definitely was daunting uh, coming out of a PhD program and from the West, you know, in the Western United States, moving to the East Coast and sort of jumping feet first into economic consulting. But, you know, I've always had an interest in politics, in political economy, uh, you know, which antitrust, uh, ha, you know, has has some deep connections to. Um, always interested in sort of the, the how markets work. And, um, and and started in energy and natural resources and then expanded into um, into all areas across regulation and antitrust. But, I, you know, I think the roots of my interest really came from, you know, coming from from immigrant families. You know, both sets of grandparents were immigrants and, you know, they were real uh, blue collar workers, you know, which which I say proudly. They were carpenters and garment district workers in New York City. They were a really vocal, talkative group. Heard a lot of talk about unions and working conditions and job loss. And, you know, as kids, we really were impressed by, um, by, by the, our, our grandparents who were not wealthy. In fact, they were, they were, uh, they were poor. Uh, and how they struggled to pay the bills and had to make choices between uh, buying food versus paying rent. And, you know, all of that sort of emphasized the importance of, uh, of markets and free enterprise and opportunity in the U.S.-based system. And um, I think that is an enduring value that, that I carry, and hopefully that others will as well. And, and that's what's kind of kept me going for years now. So, Diana, you know, I, I reflect back a few years ago. I remember looking up one day and realizing that all five commissioners at the Federal Trade Commission were women. Um, and uh, not the case today, but but for a period of time, um, it seemed awfully unwise to go in and make a presentation to the FTC if you had, you know, a, uh, you know, a sea of gray flannel suits and ties. Um, <laughs> what what does so? I mean, we see some progress on the one hand, but I think as, as I sit here, I, I wonder if there isn't more to do, particularly on the private side. What, what are your thoughts about that? So, so John, t tell me exactly what you mean by the private, side. Sure. private enforcers. And uh, I'm talking yeah, yes, yeah. private, so, private enforcers, private, primarily, primarily private law firms. Although I, 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 I my sense is, and, and, and maybe you have a different view. My sense is the plaintiff's bar is doing better in terms of promoting women to, to positions to be lead counsel, et cetera. But, but is there more to do? What could we be doing? Yeah, I think, I think there is more, you know, for my generation, I think the big, you know, the big, um, break or transition was was going from a world where you were in the office, you know, 60 or 70 hours a week 
working on cases, you know, deep into the evening and across the weekends, lots of travel. And it really posed a challenge for women who wanted to um, raise families, but also excel at their firms and, um, and in the government. And um, choices had to be made for, you know, back, back in my day, uh, there were a lot of really competent lawyers, uh, women in antitrust, who couldn't make partner because they, they wanted to have kids and they wanted to spend time with their families, but they couldn't log the hours, the billable hours to do that. And so that was a real barrier for, for women in terms of upward mobility. I think now with remote working and, and, uh, and telecommuting and more flexible workplaces, um, we're, that has just sort of revolutionized the field and, and removed a major uh, you know, roadblock for women. I, but I also think that women still face challenges in the courtroom in terms of being lead and co-counsel and, and female economists, uh, uh, you know, working on cases as experts. Um, it, you know, I think this has to be sort of a broader movement and recognition that uh, women are incredibly important in, in the workforce, but also bring really special skills uh, to to antitrust enforcement and uh, especially in, in litigating cases. And we see some just amazingly talented women out there who are who are litigating complex cases, who are negotiating uh, really important settlements for victims of, of antitrust violations. And, uh, you know, I do everything I can to support that. Diana, um, I wanted to dovetail on a point that you made in when you introduced the section when you were like, oh, women um, growing present in antitrust law is something that you care about and is maybe specific to your gender, but maybe not. I think you're absolutely right that um, it's something that I don't think, I think women value a lot in seeing these changes um, and we want to be at the table, um, but I don't think this is an issue that... Um, like when John commented on seeing um, and how, how he notices that, like, look, at one point, all five commissioners are women. It's something that I think men also um, should care about. And I think a lot of men in my career have um, and can also um, just, I think it might be a little daunting if like a man were on this podcast and talking about like, oh, I, I, I mean, I haven't heard them uh, any recently say like, oh, I am really appreciative of the growing presence of women. But it's something that I do think that I've seen men really care, uh, care about in terms of hiring decisions, mm-hmm. promotions, sponsoring mentorship. And um, this is like for the men who are listening, um, we love it when you are kind of behind it. And it's like um, you, a lot of times you're in a position to help um, equalize the playing field um, and to step up and comment on on um, the importance of these values. Well, this, this I, agree, I agree with you, Tammy. I, I sorry, John. I just just one quick quick comment there. I I think that's absolutely true, and I, I have to say, in my own career, some of my strongest advocates for working flexible hours and part time and and accommodating, you know, wanting to raise a family have been men. And to this very day on my own advisory board, uh, and AAI has worked very hard to increase the diversity on our, on our pro on our programs and our conferences and panels. And we have done that absolutely successfully. And, um, you know, I think that is, that is a goal that's supported by everybody. Well, this, this feels like a topic that we ought to take up in much more detail on a future program, but, uh, but very, very helpful and good comments in the interest of time. Um, let's turn to three things that you don't like Diana. And what is, what is thing number one? What is the, what is one thing that you don't like about the antitrust bar or the antitrust law? So I think number one on my list is what I perceive to be still a fair amount of polarization in the antitrust bar. And what I mean by that is, you know, sort of a, uh, sometimes a pitched battle or, or just really hard lines between how plaintiffs and defense practitioners approach uh, the issues. Uh, there's been significant improvement um, on this, but uh, I think it continues uh, to some extent today. Any suggestions on how we fix that? Well, I think that the antitrust section has already started doing that. Um, you, you know, the, the, uh, you see a lot more uh, plaintiffs. Uh, type voices on programs, brown bags, the, um, you know, the spring uh, meetings, the fall forum. 
So uh, that effort, I think, went into into place about ten years ago, and the people who are responsible for that should be really, um, you know, really congratulated. Uh, so I think there's more um, efforts to sort of provide a balanced, um, uh, you know, balanced views on these things. It's, you know, it comes out in interesting ways in in particular areas of the law and um, on particular topics. Uh, you know, one for one example is is sort of these. Um, the, the the differences in views between those who who really are more more concerned about anti-competitive effects on uh, and, and effects on consumers versus those who come to the table sort of with the the premise that well most mergers for example are pro-competitive um, um, y- you know certain forms of conduct uh, can be pro-competitive. Uh, and we see this with sort of the the shifting from per se violations to rule of reason analysis, but it does come out particularly in that in 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 those two perspectives. Excellent. Well, let's let's turn to number two. What is the second thing you don't like, or you would change about the antitrust law or antitrust bar? So I and I don't know if this this is a this is a personal dislike and I think the I think I stand in unity with the antitrust bar um, and 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 this is particularly important today as we see proposals legislative proposals for uh, wholesale antitrust reforms and changing the standards and um, uh, throwing the old laws out and bringing new laws in uh, and that's that antitrust should not. Uh, really be used for things it wasn't designed for. You know, antitrust is not sector regulation. Antitrust is law enforcement. There are, you know, very, it's a, it's an exacting uh, um, method and um, uh, it, it is not sort of a broad sweeping public interest standard type of, of regulatory um, regulatory initiative. That's not the way the laws were intended. Um, so in the debate we have right now around very large companies, big tech in particular, uh, breakup proposals, there's a tendency to really load up antitrust with responsibility for fixing all problems. But uh, obviously not all problems can be fixed by antitrust. Those problems need to be specific to competitive harms. And, um, and uh, uh, I think... Uh, you know, I think some some slowing down, some introspection, and and protection of what antitrust is designed to do is is really needed at this time. Uh, Diana, I have a question about that. So, um, in terms of antitrust um, being loaded up and um, taking on too much weight, and I think some of the other. Um, outside of antitrust areas to address some of these issues in big tech might be privacy and big data privacy, private, um, sharing consumer data and limiting those. Um, and I was curious, so antitrust is a field where um, economists play a big role in. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts on kind of um, also using uh, data privacy law to uh, regulate big tech. And um, what do you see as the role of economists um, in in that area, right? That's a really good question. So, and and Tammy, your example is a really good one. So, you know, the systemic broad privacy problems that we see popping up in in um, some big tech market players, uh, social social media and networking, for example. Um, the 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 best policy tool for that is. Is, is probably social regulation, right? Um, similar to health and human safety regulation, but to protect consumer privacy. Um, antitrust can get at some privacy issues, but it isn't, it's gonna be very surgical. It's gonna, remedies are gonna be very specific. Uh, markets are typically narrowly defined uh, and competitive problems are very, very well defined uh, using antitrust you know, methods, but you know, uh, so antitrust can get at some privacy issues, which we, you know, consider to be sort of an, a quality dimension of competition. But for the types of things that we're dealing with now with some of the digital platforms, I, I think another policy tool, social regulation, is best for privacy. So, you know, the role of economists in all of this, I think, is really, really important. Uh, the platforms, the digital platforms are complex, obviously, Um uh, there are ecosystems of markets. There are some unique features. Economists play a really important role in sort of defining those and 
and um, and and uh, developing approaches to determining uh, if you know if there is competitive harm and what does it look like. Um, I I am sort of a believer that um, economics is a vitally important part of the antitrust um, enterprise, but but uh, we've sort of shifted away a bit over time. Uh, giving lots and lots of weight to the role of economics and perhaps less weight to the law and to the importance of legal precedent and legal constructs. And I would like to see a rebalancing of that um, as we as we move forward. And we have fought for that in, at AAI for many years now. So this is, again, probably a topic for another day. Really, really interesting stuff. But let's turn to Thing number three, what is the third thing you would change or don't like about the antitrust law or antitrust bar? So I think thing number three is a little more esoteric, and it and it really has to do with um, kind of a shift in the landscape in many key sectors and, and markets. And, and that's what I call sort of the verticalization of um, – of healthcare, uh, for example, agricultural biotechnology, um, media, media content and distribution, and, and that's sort of the, the trend towards vertical integration, uh, where you have you know single firms controlling several levels in a supply chain. For example, in ag biotech, we we with the Monsanto Bear and the Dow Dupont mergers, we see you know control of traits, seeds, and chemicals. In um, healthcare, with uh, CVS Aetna, for example, uh, and Express Scripts Cigna, we see control of health insurance and retail pharmacy and pharmacy benefit management. Um, there's lots more examples, and but the concern is this: when you have firms uh, integrating like this, um, it, it it absolutely throws up barriers to entry, makes entry more difficult because firms have to enter at more than one level, and um, it sort of discourages competition uh, at the individual levels in the supply chain. Uh, and, and so it kind of shifts the paradigm. We're, we're now going to be looking at uh, questions like, well, how many platforms do you need in there uh, to, that, to constitute effective competition? Uh, is having CVS Aetna, United Healthcare, OptumRx, and Express Script Cigna enough, you know, to have three integrated platforms? Is that going to be enough? competition uh, where they each compete head to head. Uh, you know, same thing on the ag biotech side. Uh, how many platforms are you going to need in there to constitute effective competition? Those are not easy questions. And I think enforcers are really struggling with those questions right now. Diana, in your practice, so we are seeing a lot of uh, vertical mergers, some of the ones that you mentioned in healthcare um, and media content and distribution. And then there there might be some easier cases, like, um, well, one that happened a few years ago that I was uh, a little bit surprised at how quickly it cleared was Amazon's purchase of Whole Foods, also a vertical merger um, that didn't get much scrutiny at all. Um, what is your quick take on um, when you see a vertical merger um, what you kind of look at and consider first in um, thinking about whether it's problematic to competition or not. Right, right. That's a great question. So I think the first thing I look at is, and and I'm a I'm a I'm a a fan of certain certain presumptions. We already have the structural presumption for horizontal mergers. You know, highly concentrated mergers are, are likely to adversely affect competition. I, I think it's time to start thinking about, and many people have done this already, economists and, and lawyers, uh, about, um, you know, presumptions in other areas, uh, for example, vertical mergers or presumptions for acquisitions of nascent competitors. So I, when I see a big vertical merger, first thing I look at is, well, is is the upstream market concentrated? So, for example, in CBS Aetna, is the market for pharmacy benefit management concentrated? Um, you know, if so, that can, that can absolutely increase incentives to uh, engage in, you know, conduct like trying to foreclose rivals. You know, you would also look at downstream markets. So, is the health insurance market highly concentrated? And and looking at those market structures, I think, is this really, really good information about uh, how concerned enforcers should be right off the bat about whether a merger is anti-competitive or not. And, um, you know, certainly this popped up in AT&T, Time Warner, 
uh, and the like. But <clears throat> that's really a sort of the starting point, I think, for assessing the lay of the land. So, so that's probably another one uh, that we could do a, a full podcast on as well. <laughs> but I think that Indeed. I think we've now gotten that's three things you like and three things you ch- three things you keep, three things you change. So, Diana, if I could, let me shift gears slightly. Um, uh, I think our listeners would be interested in learning maybe a little bit more about you. So, could you tell us something unusual about yourself that we would not know if we only knew you professionally? Sure. So, I I, I think uh, many people know this, but not everyone. I uh, have worked 30 years in Washington, D.C., The the vast majority of my career has been in D.C., but I have only lived in D.C. for about half that time. So I actually live in Boulder, Colorado, and um, commute to D.C. on a pretty regular basis. And while I'm here, uh, I do lots of stuff that I've always enjoyed doing, and one of those things includes climbing mountains. And I was just out the other day up in our beautiful Indian Peaks wilderness. So I do a lot of mountain climbing, a lot of backcountry skiing, and... um, uh, it's just a it's a really nice counterbalance to the intensity and the energy uh, that you get in Washington and particularly in in uh, in the antitrust area. You know, Diana, if you live in Diana, uh, when, uh, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Diana. Go ahead, Diana. Uh, okay, cool. Diana, when you say uh, climbing mountains, do you mean do you climb mountains with like do you use like the ropes and stuff or do you just kind of <laughs> I don't know what that term is, just is it free soloing? No rope climbing clubs. What do you? What do you? No. Mean? <laughs> Definitely not a free soloer. No, I'm a non-technical climber. So I'm I'm the kind of person who slogs it to slogs it to the top of fourteeners and uh, wherever I can get to the top of something. Also, just very high elevation trekking. You know, about twelve and a half thousand feet, uh, where there are some just incredible vistas and uh, you feel like you're standing on the top of the world. It's just wonderful. Okay, so so you it wasn't you in that movie, um, number one. And, and, and if you and the other comment I have is that if you are commuting from Boulder, your commute may be equivalent in time to my cute commute from Bethesda. But in any event, I think we're uh, I think we're probably now at the point in the show where we do our final segment, which is called the Curious Hat. And now it's time for the Curious Hat. Okay, Diana, this is the the part of the the part of the show where I have a hat here with me, um, and uh, I'd like you to pick a number between one and fifteen. In the hat, there are index cards with all the the questions on them. Pick, if you pick a number between one and fifteen, I will ask you that numbered question. Okay, how about fifteen? Question number fifteen. Okay. What do you wish you knew when you started your career? Oh, that's a, that's a good one. It's, it's a toughie. Um, all right. So I think my answer uh, hopefully would be useful to younger people coming into, into antitrust. So when I started out of grad school, I jumped right into litigation support. You know, I worked seven or eight years on mostly on the defense side. Uh, doing antitrust cases, working 80 hours a week, uh, expert, you know, testimony, the the whole work, you know, remember I'm an economist. Um, And, you know, getting locked into that life is, um, it's hugely valuable. I couldn't do what I do now without having done that work uh, and also without having worked in the federal government. But um, I wish at that point I knew, I I, I wish at that point I had known that there were more options for me. Um, So it's not just, you know, practicing the law. It's not just serving as, as in, in a support capacity in litigation as an economist. There's lots of stuff to do. Uh, policy analysis is an, a burgeoning role in antitrust for good policy analysts, uh, people who can integrate law, economics, institutional analysis. So um, uh, there's also really important government work to be done, you know, and it is public service, but it's vitally important. So I wish back then I had a, had had a bigger radar screen where I could have uh, really understood what the what the, what was on the menu in terms of how I could develop my career. I got there eventually, but it was you know it was the school of hard knocks and lots of introspection and and that sort of thing. But again, that was all very valuable experience for getting where to where I am now. Well, Diana, I think that's that's good advice. I think that uh, in life, the you rarely find a straight path. 
um, and and all the experiences are good. Well, I think we're out of time. So thank you so much for being on it. That will do it for today's episode of our Curious Amalgam, and we will see you next time. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Curious Amalgam, a competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by ABA's Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent their employer or other organizations. If you like what you heard or would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the Antitrust Section has to offer at ambar.org antitrust. You can learn more about our podcast at ourcuriousamalgam.org. If you have comments, suggestions, or podcasts, podcast ideas, please reach out to us at podcast at ourcuriousamalgam.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.